Good morning, your graces, reverend clergy, presbyteras, fellow colleagues, students, and guests, good morning. Fellow Packer fans, uh, good morning. Um, so in a conference on speaking to secular America, I'm asked to give a parenting talk. I said, uh, you want me to talk about parenting? I said, well, on one hand, I can understand how it's important for us to prepare our kids to go out in the world as Orthodox Christians, um, and we'll talk about that. And then on the other hand, upon just limited reflection, recognizing that the home, in many ways, is our primary mission field, because it's in the home that we are raising disciples of Christ, forming the hearts and minds of persons. Not only in the home are we feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and visiting the sick. <laughs> the home is the single greatest influence on personhood for us. And in many ways, that's why I chose my field, because I grew up in a big, fat Greek family. <laughs> and uh, as I learned about orthodoxy and got involved, I did youth ministry. And I realized two things. Number one, the teenagers and their struggles came right out of what was happening in their homes. And I said, I'm getting them too late. I'd like to work with the parents in the home, that we have Christian homes that forms these kids. And the second thing I realized is we can do what we want with the teens, but guess what home they're going right back into. So that shifted my interest in looking at the, the church of the home. Second thing is, in my mind, it's one of the greatest crises we face as a country is this breakdown of the family. Absent fathers, absent mothers, divorce, uh, which fractures children's souls in many ways, and they grow up as fractured adults. Um, in many ways, we see adults being pulled away by things outside the home from this primary vocation of husband and wife and father and mother. Um, and really, it's interesting because we can talk about going out into the secular world as Christians, but I really do believe that the greatest influence we will have on the world is our children, for those of us who are called to have children, that this is the greatest legacy we leave, is we are forming their hearts and their minds and their souls. And these people will grow up to leave the world. So we want to um, attend to that because it's easily forgotten, especially for clergy and for people going out of the world, that actually that mission field in the home. It's easy to lose sight of how important it is because you don't get awards for it, the pay is pretty poor, and you don't speak in conferences about motherhood or fatherhood. Um, so it's easy when I looked at the title of this talk, Raising Children Who Will Hold On to the Faith in a Secular Age, to be worried. It's a little bit of a scary title. Um, will our kids hold on to the faith? We live in a secular age. And it seems like the values of the world around us are increasingly contrary to what the church reveals to us, what Christ reveals to us through the church as true, good, and right. And it's really easy when you hear talks that are entitled, Will There Be a Church in the Future? And that more people are leaving the church to be worried, to be scared. Scared of the future of the church, scared for the future of our country, and scared for our children. In fact, if we had a way to know if we knew what could we do so our children would hold on to the faith, that would be good, right? Because then we wouldn't have to worry as much. In fact, if there was some way we could have certainty that our kids will stay connected to Christ in the church when they leave, I could rest a little easier. We could all rest a little easier, right? Because it's easy to feel scared and fearful about what's going on in the world. It's scary as a parent when we feel like everything around us seems to be getting completely out of control, out of our control, but out of God's control. As a parent, I was surprised when I experienced this, how many things there are to be scared of when you become a parent. I didn't expect it, but it started right away. When our first child was born, we were in the hospital room and they put Kirana in the bassinet and we were up, we were wired, we've been up for a long time. And we thought, can we go to sleep? What if we sleep? Who's going to be watching the baby? What if something happens to this baby while we're sleeping? And you know, it took a little while. And by the third, we went right to sleep. But um, it's scary. It's scary to watch a toddler playing on a play structure. They could fall. They could fall, and they could break their necks. 
and the mind goes right to that fear. Um, and it keeps going. Our seven-year-old, you know, said, can I go down the street, two doors, to play, to see if the neighbor's kids are in? And we're like, yes, but call us right when you get there. Because it's scary for the seven-year-old to walk on his own in the street. You know, really, what exactly could happen? He's gonna get, there's going to be a, a dark van that's waiting on the corner that is going to abduct him in the minute or something. So the fear doesn't make so much sense. But the fear seems to be ever-present. And then your child gets a driver's license and takes the car out. And where does the parent's mind go? Do you know how many things could happen with this child in the car? Child doesn't know it, but oh my gosh, and we live in Boston. <laughs> so uh, is that even being responsible that I'm letting this 16-year-old take this you know, metal object on wheels and moving it around? And there's not much answer to that. It's fear. And then they go away to college. And we know what happens in colleges, right? There's godless worlds of licentiousness that we send our kids into and we don't know what they're doing and we don't know where they are and with whom they're speaking. More of this parental fear. And I've learned there is a lot of fear. And the temptation as parents when we're afraid is to parent out of fear, to control, to restrict, to warn them about all the dangers that could happen to them. Or then what else do we do? Well, if we're really committed people, parents, we bring people in to give talks about what can we do so when they leave, they will hold on to our faith. But if we parent out of fear, we pass along fear to our children. And they will hold on to that fear as they go out into the world. What our kids need is to have judgment, to have the skills to navigate the dangers of life. And our goal has to be to equip them with those skills and judgment, to be aware of the dangers and know how to keep themselves safe. Teaching them those skills is far more effective than instilling fear in them. Because few things inhibit good judgment, like fear. But if we want our kids to hold on to faith, not fear, as they go into the world, um, but we want them to hold on to faith, not fear. And in fact, fear has very little to do with our faith. Fear, in many ways, is a reflection of a lack of faith. But I wanted to start just by naming fear, and we're going to come back to that, because we have to figure out what to do with that. Secondly, what exactly do we mean holding on to the faith? What do we want them to hold on to? Do we mean that we want to raise kids to go to church on Sunday when they grow up? That's good. Is that our goal? It's tempting to think as parents that our goal is to raise kids to behave a certain way so that when they're in our homes, we force them to behave a certain way so that we hope when they leave, they will continue to behave in that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't work because it's not enough. Although it's important to have limits and consequences on our kids' behavior, and it's good to have some rules of behavior in your homes, our kids will reject our rules as soon as they are able. They're too smart to do things just because we say, and there are too many competing ideas around them from the peers, their world, and the media. They're not going to do what we want just because we think it's important. Or they might when they come home, or if we force them. But as soon as they leave, they'll be free from that. Unless there's something deeper. Unless those rules make sense to them. Unless they understand and believe these rules and guidelines. If we want our kids to hold on to our faith when they leave, it means they have to have that faith deep in their hearts when they leave our homes. It means it has to be their faith, not just ours, by the time they leave. And if our faith is nothing more than going to our church, our kids will understandably drop these empty rituals as soon as they leave and replace it with something that mean, makes more sense to them or is easier, like sleeping in on a Sunday or going for a walk or just hanging out with friends. And we can call them up at college and say, did you go to church today? And they might feel guilty or avoid the question or get annoyed that that's all we seem to care about. But these empty rituals, um, if they're empty rituals to them, they're going to stop doing it because we think it's important. 
That's maybe what family reunions are for, forcing them to do things they don't want to do. But faith, in order to be faith, we want them to internalize this deep in their hearts. Our goal as parents is to raise kids who understand Christ and his church as the center of their lives, who internalize deep in their hearts what's true, what's good, what's right, and what's real. Internalize in their hearts that God is real and active in this world. We want them to know in their hearts that God created the world out of love and he created us as an act of love so that we can be in relationship with him and his love. St. Clement of Alexandria writes, the primary lesson for life must be implanted in the soul from the earliest age. The primary lesson for children is to know the eternal God, the one who gives everlasting life. Our goal is to raise up children who understand themselves as children of God and who live their lives according to his commandments, who understand themselves as citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. More than just behaving or holding on to our faith, our goal is that our children internalize this identity about themselves, that they know what is true about who they are and who they are called to be and become. Our goal is to help our children understand themselves and others as children of God, icons of Christ, holy images of God himself. Successful kids know that deep within their hearts, they are loved by God and by us and desire to freely return that love. That's what I call real self-esteem. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We want our kids to know that they are liturgical beings created for worship, and that our response to God's invitation of love is to offer ourselves back up to him with thanksgiving and that that central act of thanksgiving is the Eucharist, that we were created for worship and we become fully human as we gather as church, the body of Christ, in worship. That church, far from being an empty ritual, is what makes us who we are, the body of Christ. And we know that this reality of the kingdom of God and of liturgy, that God doesn't descend on Sundays, but that we ascend to that heavenly altar. We want to raise kids who know that the kingdom of heaven is real and that we are its citizens. Citizens of heaven who live in the world according to God's ways, God's values, and his virtues. Rather than raising kids who hold on to the faith, our goal is to raise kids who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that all things will be added unto them. For our children to hold on to their faith, they must, by the time they leave our homes, internalize these values and virtues of the kingdom of God. It has to mean something to them to pursue meekness, purity of heart, peacemaking, patience, long-suffering, faithfulness. Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So that when they go away to college or get married, they live according to these values. Not because we are watching or because we say so. Because they believe these things deep in their heart that these things are true and right. We want our kids to grow up hungering for righteousness so they will be filled. We want them to know deep in their hearts that the path of success is actually the path of struggling toward holiness, becoming saints. How's that for a parenting goal? That's a tall order. Yet that's our vocation. That's our role. And as Orthodox, we believe that this path of true life is the path of acquiring the Holy Spirit. More than holding on to the faith or acting like Christians, for us, thriving means acquiring the Holy Spirit. St. Seraphim of Sarov, the true aim of our Christian life consists of acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God. As for fasts and vigils and prayers and almsgiving, and every good deed done for Christ's sake are only the means 
of acquiring the Holy Spirit of God. So our faith is not just about external practices and behaviors, but an inner transformation of the person. Which means we want to raise children who pay attention to their inner life, who know that the kingdom of God is within, Luke 17, 21. And know that our call to become fully human is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not about acting like Christ, but being united to Christ, grafted onto the vine. There's a little bit more we want our kids to hold on to. We want them to know that we acquire the Holy Spirit through this participation in the sacramental life of the church. Not just going to church on Sundays, but with all our days and our whole lives connected to this reality of the church and the kingdom of God. So it's far more than external behavior, but about our inner life, our hearts and minds and souls and strength turned toward God. It's about our conversion daily to Christ. We know they're going to make mistakes, but we want our kids to know about the joy of repentance. We want them to know that no matter how much they stumble, they have a heavenly Father who is waiting, looking for that return with open arms, not to give a consequence to the prodigal, but to welcome him or her back. We do this because we know this is the path of success, that this is what it means to thrive as humans when we respond to God's invitation with all our hearts, minds, and souls. Our faith is not something we hold on to, but it's someone whom we seek to know and to love, Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit, that we direct our lives toward Him and His body, the church. That we want our kids to know that church is where the kingdom of heaven is breaking into our world. More than hold on to, we want our kids by the time they leave our homes to know in their hearts this reality of the kingdom of God within them and in and through the church and to live by, to walk in faith connected to his life-giving body. So how do we get our kids to internalize the reality of the kingdom of God? How do we get them to believe and to follow Notice, as an aside, that our faith has little to do with fear. In fact, if we want our kids, by the time they leave our homes, to know that we are the light of the world as followers of Christ, we want them to know that no matter how dark the world is or how crazy the world is around us, what's in us is stronger than what's out there because we believe that the darkness cannot overtake the light. We want to raise kids who know this and who walk without fear, but with faith in the light. In fact, we know that because Christ is the light of the world, the darkness cannot overtake it. And we need to recognize that the best response to an ever-changing and seemingly godless world is exactly that, to go forth as the light. Or, like we say in sports, the best defense is a good offense. To go out in faith, hope, love, not fear. John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Elder Thaddeus writes, love is the most powerful means of defense there is. There are no weapons and no power that can measure themselves against love. Everything is defeated in love. In fact, it's not a question if the church will be around. That's the only thing we can rest assured will be true. Governments, empires, countries, nations come and go. But the gates of Hades will not prevail against this church. This is why we do not fear nor become anxious and troubled, but cling to Christ and the church. We can't reach out to secular America out of fear or because of fear, but in faith and love, as an act of faith and love. And we can't parent in fear, but need to parent in faith and love as an act of faith and love. The only question is, will I choose to be part 
of that life-giving body. Is Christ in the church the center of my life? Now, how do we give that to our children? How do we pass that along? And the short answer is, we don't. We don't. Sister Magdalene, the author of Children in the Church Today, writes, our goal as parents is not to transmit faith. That is the work of divine grace. And our task is to foster the work of divine grace. So I could end my talk at this point, because we are not the ones passing on faith, but we do serve a critical role in fostering the work of grace. But unless we're clear about what's God's job in our child's faith transformation and what's our role, we will get confused. And in many ways, parenting is like growing a plant. You know, we have tomato plants outside in our backyard. We don't really grow tomato plants. We can't. <laughs> That's the work of, we might call it nature, but there's a lot we can do to nurture an environment for that plant to thrive. We provide the light, we provide the food, we provide the water. But no matter what, if you try and get that plant to grow, and so even when we work on attending to the plant and learn a lot about what we can do to create an environment for that plant to thrive, any good farmer knows, it's not up to me. This will occur. Our role as parents is to foster the work of grace, to provide the environment for our children to grow and thrive and internalize this real faith, to nurture this real faith so that they internalize God, Christ, and his church as real, true, and right. How do we do that? Well, let me suggest parenting Creating an environment for kids to thrive is like a three-legged stool. Three-legged stool. Each leg in a three-legged stool is very important. In fact, you would argue each leg is the most important leg. But in a three-legged stool, which leg is the most important? Yes. <laughs> what are those three legs, each of which is critical and needs to be there? Number one, our own life as parents. How we live. Number two, how we relate to the child. And number three, the connection of our home to the church. Now, while God can raise up saints from stone and God will call people to his church, whether they had parents who were connected to the church, whether they had parents' life, that happens. What we're talking about now is how we nurture the culture of faith. And it's that three-legged stool. Without either any one of those, the stool is going to tip. We can go to church all the time, right? We can have our homes really connected to the church. But if we don't have a good relationship with our kids, they're going to get out and split as soon as possible. We can live a nice moral life. We can have a great relationship with our kids. But if our home isn't connected to the church, we're going to deprive our kids of that understanding of what's real and what's true. <coughs> so I just want to talk a little bit about these three legs and what our role is. In many ways, we might say the first leg is the most important. Our life, how we live. And this aspect is found most in our tradition. Elder Porfirius writes, what saves and makes for good children is the life of the parents in the home. The parents need to devote themselves to love of God. They need to become saints in relation to their children. And the joy that will come to them, the holiness that will visit them, will shower grace on their children. Uh, you may have heard of that book, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He has a great quote, don't worry that your kids don't listen to what you say. Worry that you're, they're watching what you're doing. <laughs> that our kids can tell what's important to us by how we live in the privacy of our homes. They can see what do we really value? What do we spend our time on? What do we spend our money on? What's important to us? If you want to raise saints, become a saint. If you want to teach children that the spiritual life is real, live the spiritual life in Christ daily. They'll figure it out. If, we want to, if you want our kids to know that the whole of the Christian life is acquiring the Holy Spirit, 
make that the central goal in your life. And all that you do and all the struggles in the home and out of the home. And your kids will see, whoa, this is real. I had a seminarian uh, in seminary, and we asked people, how did you decide to come to seminary? He was born and raised in the Greek Orthodox Church. He had heard, you know, the Gospels and the teachings. But he said he came to seminary because he had a music teacher in school that lived his Christian life. And he saw, he said, for the first time I saw, oh my gosh, he's patient, he's kind, he's gentle, he's loving, he's forgiving. So he recognized from his upbringing, but then it didn't really kick in until he saw someone actually living that. Like, you actually believe what's being said. And it had that much of an impact. And it's one thing for our kids to hear it, but if mom and dad actually are living this, it must be real. Which means when we think about raising kids to understand this life, the inner life, we have to do more than go to church. Our kids have to see us on this spiritual journey. They will naturally understand that this is real because they have front row seats to our struggles, to our failures. They watch us when no one else is. And they can see what we really believe, not how we behave in public, but how we behave in our home. And in part, we have to recognize that it's about the inner life. Because we can have, be involved in the business of the parish and the community, right? But if our kids see the church as this club or this business that we go to and it fills our day, but there's no interior life, and we're not really paying attention to Christ and the gospel, we're going to teach them that Christ and the gospel stuff isn't real. But it's really important to be on committees and to serve the parish. It's not about doing church. It's about being church. Paying attention to the words of the liturgy. Paying attention to the gospel in our own lives. What is our life centered on? Work, family, finances, or Christ and his church? I have to say, I'm a big Packer fan. And so we know when the next Packer game is. We know Sunday night they're playing some sort of mediocre team. I forget which one it is. And my boys are watching. What is my dad scheduling his life around? And what will he never miss? A Sunday liturgy, a major feast, or a Packer game. <laughs> right? And so, there's a second part to that. Am I looking forward to the Packer game? Am I excited about the Packer game? My kids are watching. What brings my dad joy? What's meaningful? Or do I say, son, we just have to go to a Packer game, and we show up late. You know, we pay no attention to the game. We don't really know the rules. And he asked me, Dad, why are we doing this? I said, well, this is really important to do. <laughs> and I'm on my phone or I'm completely distracted. Now imagine we know the feast that's coming up. The feast brings my dad joy. We never miss a feast, but sometimes things get in the way of the Packer game. What they're seeing in their parents is what drives them, what is really meaningful. Are we seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Do we want to learn? Do, how do, we, do we want our kids to learn that worship is central to life? Or that prayer is actually real? We don't need to teach them that. We just need to live that. How do we act in the home? How do we behave? How do we treat other people? What gets us upset when the lamp cracks? When you scratch my car, when you ruined our expensive rug, or you stained my suit, does that set me off? Or when I see you lie, or when I see you hit, or react negatively? What's the big deal to my parents? Notice, they're noticing our inner life. They're noticing what's real. What does my dad and mom live for? What do we react to? Because if we pay more attention to a lamp that's broken and react than we do, let's say, when we, I don't know, miss church or treat each other disrespectfully or are impatient in the home, if the lamp gets more of a reaction than impatience, we're sending a powerful message about what we value. Do our kids see us 
pursuing spiritual wealth. My kids ask us all the time, you know, are we rich or are we poor? We live in a tiny house. And my answer is, we've got six kids. We're one of the richest families I know. Oh, sorry, seven. I'm glad my wife is here to correct me. I say one of the richest families I know. We have seven kids. And you know, they give us the eye roll, right? Because they're looking. Because in the mess, they go to homes and people are commenting on wealth and they're aware of material things. What are their parents living for? What do we enjoy? What, what do we think is important? Essentially, the first leg of the stool is be the child, be the person you want your kids to become. Live the life you know is true and meaningful, that you may show them how to live with what's true and meaningful. Be more focused on forcing yourself to act on what's true and right than fo forcing your child to act on what's true and right. What's the best way to teach patience? What's the best way to teach gentleness? What's the best way to teach self-control? Right. In fact, there is no other way to teach patience. You know, I've tried yelling at my kids to be patient. <laughs> it's a little bit of a problem. There's another problem. You know what my kids see when they sit in that front row of my own spiritual inner world? I like to think that it's the manure that you put on the tomato plant that lets the plant really grow. <laughs> They're going to see that I'm not a great dad. They're going to see me make mistakes. They're going to see me snap. They're going to see me talk disrespectfully to my wife. They're going to see me freak out about something I shouldn't freak out about. That first leg of the stool means what else do they need to see me do right after that? They need to see me repent. Because even in our failures, we can help them internalize what is true. That our call is not to be perfect, but to be perfected. And that path of perfection is not a path of defending our mistakes. Well, you know, you shouldn't have broke the lamp. I wouldn't have got upset. Or if you kids were just nice, obedient, I could be a patient, kind, loving dad. <laughs> that even in our failures, we teach them what's real. And what's real is this reality of God and his unending love and mercy and forgiveness. And it's OK to make mistakes. It's not OK to defend and deny. That in our repentance, we teach them the path of life. That is it really true what we believe that about forgiveness we hear in the church? Only when they see it enacted in the home. So that we our kids learn that they don't need to be perfect kids just repentant kids. That they learn that we are not a perfect family, we are a repentant family. And that the goal of parenting is not to parent perfectly. Our kids don't need perfect parents, they need repentant parents. The spirit of faith and piety in the parents should be regarded as the most powerful means for the preservation, upbringing, strengthening of the life of grace in children, St. Theophon the Recluse. And this first leg is so important because they will follow us. They are wired to become like us. They will follow us to the kingdom of heaven. But remember, there's two other legs to this stool. And that second critical leg is how we relate to our children. And the fact is, the closer we're connected to our children, the more they know our love, and the more they love us, the more they will become who we are. The more they will go where we are headed. Because really, if you just had that first leg of becoming a saint, that's great. There's a word for that. It's called monasticism. And it's nice. But now we're talking about parenting, which means we need that second leg. And that is how we relate to our kids. The closer you are to your children, the more connected they feel, the more likely they are to follow us. And how do we relate to them? Well, let's say a few words on that second piece. There's a lot to be said on this second piece. In fact, this second leg, there's a lot of literature, secular literature, Catholic literature, about parenting, how you raise kids. There's not very much 
uh, in this in the Orthodox literature um, until December of this year when I finished that manuscript. <laughs> because we see, oftentimes, we have these ideas about what it means to live the Christian life, and we're trying to do it. And then we see our kids not do it. They're not very patient. They hit each other. They take each other's food. They take each other's clothes. They fight over everything. And what's our temptation? Number one, fear. Number two, criticism. That we think that, ah, if I point out your faults and how you are not living like a Christian, somehow that'll help you live the Christian life. So we need to talk a little bit about how we relate to our children and why, if we understand how to relate, and we get these three legs of this stool lined up, why we have nothing to fear. Because if we're clear about parenting, I'm clear, we're clear, that Georgia and I will have the greatest influence on them. And it's really not about Georgia and I, because we're just struggling along, doing a lot of mistaking and repenting. But that that light of Christ, then, becomes more powerful than all the crazy forces in the world. So let's talk a little bit about how we relate to our children. We could say they need to be loved, and that's true. And I would say you can't love your child too much, but you can love your child in the wrong way. Some typical examples, we love them by indulging them. We love them by making their life easy. We love them by providing things we never had when we were young. Or the opposite, we love them by criticizing them. We love them by correcting them. We love them by telling them what they should do. That's not love. And it undermines the whole context. So I want to describe that love in a, little, in a different language. Number one, we love them because we are madly in love with them and we delight that they are in our homes every day. That they are a gift handed to us. And you know, we heard last night that when you stand in front of an icon, what do you see? Well, when you stand in front of your child, what do you see? Do you see a burden? Do you see faults? Or do you see Christ? Do you see a gift from God that's been handed to you? And how should we respond when we're handed this gift? Thank you very much. And they need to know that I cannot believe I get to be your parent that I am madly in love with you and I am delighted that I get to be with you. Why would we say that? Because we feel that? Well, we'll talk about our feelings in a minute. I'm suggesting that as the dad, I am an icon of the father. That my child will learn about God's love from me. It's a little bit of an indictment, a little danger, but the truth is, the Father's love needs to inform how I relate to my children. And what's the primary, predominant disposition of God toward us? Madly in love with us and completely delighted. I don't feel that all the time. But why don't I feel that delight all the time? Because it's not true or because I'm not connected to that truth? So we realize that my failure to see Christ and my failure to delight is my own limitations. That's my problem, not this gift from heaven in front of me. Number two, it's really easy to delight in children when they're asleep. <laughs> when you could get a good report from school. When they're getting along, we can delight in them. When is it hard to delight in them? Well when they do what some people call misbehaving, right? When in fact is more accurately called behaving like a child. When we're overwhelmed, when it's hard, when it's a struggle, it is a struggle. And it's important for our kids to know that we delight that they are a gift even in the struggle. How can I say that? I can say that because we are all orthodox and we know what love is. We know love is that self-sacrificial giving. That, ah, you know, it's one thing to say you love me when it's easy for you. But how do I know when you really love me? Is when it comes with a cost. That love is when we respond with delight and joy 
at 2 in the morning when we have throw up all over us and all over the bed and all over the wall. And our child might even say, I'm sorry, you have to clean this up. And what's our answer to that? I am delighted that I get to clean this up. <laughs> we lie to them. No, we don't lie to them. We tell them the truth. Because the truth is, they are a gift and we are delighted. Not just when they sleep through the night, we get a night of rest. But we know that our failure to delight in the middle of the night is our limitation. Because remember, what are we trying to internalize in their hearts and souls? That they are icons of Christ. And that God madly delights in them. And there's nothing they can do to change that reality. So if they're icons of Christ, how do we relate to icons of Christ? We venerate them. And we have to understand this relationship has to be one of veneration. Veneration, which is directed toward Christ. So the context, the underpinning of our relationship with them, no matter what they do, no matter how I'm feeling, no matter how sticky peanut butter is all over the walls and how many times you sit down and the milk gets knocked over and they're really making my life difficult, it doesn't change that underpinning of delight. How do we communicate that delight? Well, two things. We communicate that love. Notice I used the word delight because there's an aspect that we have to recognize of joy, that we need to be of good cheer. I know this is hard, especially if you grew up in a family where a parent said to you, if I had known how difficult it was to raise kids, I would have never had kids. <laughs> it is hard, but that's our fallenness. And that's a, that's a destructive message to send to a child because it's a lie. No matter how difficult it is, I'm delighted to be your dad because we know that that's just the joy. So how do we delight in them when they're not, when they're, when they're doing what they need to do? And how do we delight in them when they're misbehaving? Well, uh, in terms of ongoing, um, we take an interest in them. We take an interest in who they are. We take an interest to this person who's becoming. What are they like? What are they happy about? What are they sad about? Who are their friends? How do they like to spend their time? What are they learning? What are they working on? There's no substitute for time with your child. We might talk about quality time versus quantity. I don't even think it's about that. I think it's about does your child know that you are thinking about him and her all the time? So it's one thing if you're so busy that you can't make a soccer game. It's quite another if you don't even know they're playing soccer. We take an interest in who they are and we communicate to them that your world is as important as my world. Because your personhood is equal to my personhood. And I know that they think dad does the important stuff. What dad does is really important. And what message does that communicate when dad always takes a regular night where I am engaging with you? So we take an interest in them. We pay attention to them. We listen to them. So there's a lot more we can say about that, but let me throw out a few little quick little phrases. Before you correct your child, check in with them. Because the temptation is, I don't notice my kids when they, when they behave. When do I notice them? When they misbehave. So what comes out of my mouth more? You know, not, you know, I notice you being patient with your brother, but why are you hitting? Or don't hit. That's an even good one. Like, you know, they chose to hit and they didn't know. <laughs> the temptation is to pay attention when they misbehave. We need to pay attention when they behave. We need to do things like recognize their struggle. It is hard to share. We need to pay attention to their inner world and their inner life and resist the temptation to reduce children to tasks that need to be completed. Because they are not a series of tasks, although it feels like that a lot. They are persons becoming. And if we want them to internalize this reality about the Holy Spirit and their inner life, we need to pay attention to their inner life. Pay attention to how they feel. Because if we're so self-absorbed in our adult world, number one, what message does that communicate to them? And number two, what are we modeling for them? We are modeling being self-absorbed. Now, my kids need to know that I have work I have to do. 
but they also need to know that they are, the reason I'm going to work is because of them. And when I'm at work, I know where they are and what they're doing. And when I come home from work, I check in because I knew they had this, and I pay attention. Notice, we're paying attention to our kids, paying attention to their inner world. Before you correct, check in with them. Um, get curious, not furious. Right? Rethink every misbehavior. You want to check in with them first before you tell them what to do or tell them what they did wrong because that sends a powerful message. I'm more concerned about who you are as a person than how you're behaving. And the behaviors come after that. Uh, we need to learn to respond to their misbehaviors and it's really tough. It's really tough to learn what's the best response with a broken lamp with a fight. There's a lot to learn. What a powerful thing to take time out and to learn good strategies for responding to some of these chronic struggles. Um, you want to spend more time listening to your kids than speaking to them. You want to listen to their feelings. When they're melting down, recognize that. You know, we heard uh, this morning that it's reasonable to presume that we're all rational. That's not reasonable to presume for our children. It is not rational. Most of the stuff that they struggle with, you know, they'll grow out of. What's real is that they're struggling. So we need to learn how to take their struggle seriously, even when we don't take their words so seriously. What's the answer to, I hate you and this is the worst family on the planet? We don't talk like that, or what do you mean? What do you mean? Because we, don't live in fear and we don't need to control. We live in love and love is the most powerful force in the universe. So we're free to respond, what do you mean? How about I hate to go to church? Or when I grow up, I'm never going to church again. So I have to say a certain daughter of mine who shall remain nameless <laughs> heard about the topic of my talk and said, oh, that's so ironic. <laughs> Because as soon as I go to college, I'm never going to church again. <laughs> My answer? Tell me what you mean. What's church like? Because my goal is to live in this reality. So no matter what our children throw at us, we don't need them to behave. We just respond out of this reality, focusing on their person, focusing on what's true. Paying more attention to who they are and what they're struggling with what goes on in my head when my kids say stuff like that? The same thing that goes on in my head when my 16-year-old takes the car and goes into Boston. Uh, all sorts of crazy fears. But we have, that's my problem. We need to learn to parent in love. It was also mentioned, you know, when do we teach? You know, the home is the place where we teach our kids. And the reality is that this is how we teach our kids. Because only the mom and dad communicate reality by how we live and by how we respond to them and relate to them. They don't want to hear me teach them. You know, I do what's called drive-by parenting, right? You can't really say very much. So you just say one thing, kind words, right? Uh, we don't talk like that. Listen to your mother. And then you split because you're not going to get it. But just you drop this because really, they don't want to listen to what I think. But I know who I am and how I relate is more powerful than anything. The teaching comes from that. But we do need places of education to actually contribute to this. So that somewhere they're learning. So there are strategies to do to talk about the gospel and to do some teaching. But that's not our primary mode of religious education. Our primary mode, the inside track, is how we live and how we um, relate to them. And when they misbehave, we focus on keeping ourselves in control rather than controlling them. We do things like we set appropriate limits that are strict, but they're not angry. We allow our kids, as they grow, more choices. We stay involved, but not in control. And it takes some time to do that. But what our kids learn as we respond in love when they're behaving 
and respond in love when they're misbehaving. We learn how to do that. They internalize this reality that I am deeply loved. I am okay. If they ask us why do we go to church, we give them a good reason once. If they ask a second time, they're not really looking for a good reason. They just don't feel like going. And what's the answer if they just don't feel like going? Two things. It's hard. I understand your struggle. We recognize their struggle. And number two, it's mandatory. <laughs> because this is just who we are. We didn't create reality. We live within reality. And so my same daughter who shall remain nameless, oh yeah, if you force me to go to church, then as soon as I go, I'm just going to reject it because you force it. You should give me a choice. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a little impressed with her yeah. strength, right? Jeez. And so I answer, yeah. Just like we force you not to lie, cheat, and steal. So that when you leave, you're going to run and lie, cheat, and steal because we forced you not to? Hmm. Because we're, in, we're living out of what is true. This is just who we are. I'm not trying to get her to believe these things. This is just reality. In our house, we don't steal, we don't lie, we don't cheat, and we forgive. Why? Because this is real. And we go to church. Why? Because that's just reality. So we just live in this reality. She's free to have an opinion, but in areas, this is it. So the second leg of the stool is that great relationship, connected through the struggles. Um, there's one other thing I want to say about that, and that is it's very difficult to parent like this. In fact, it's actually impossible to. It's hard. It's a struggle, right? It's hard to be patient. It's hard to be kind. It's hard to be gentle, right? It's hard to be long-suffering, and we expect a four-year-old to do that. It's hard for us to do. We didn't make that rule. We didn't decide the path. That just happens to be the path. So what we see in parenting is my effort to love my child like they deserve creates a real struggle in me to live out and, and, and transform my inner life. That in my efforts to respond in love, it challenges me to live my own faith. The most powerful way to teach your kids that patience is real is that they see you struggling to be patient as we expect them to struggle to be patient. It's hypocrisy to not be patient and then give them a consequence for not being patient. Or to us lose control but expect them to have self-control. They're eight years old. We're 40-something years old. But parenting is this sacrament of my struggles of being transformed in the Holy Spirit intersecting with our kids' struggles of being formed in that same grace. But there's a third leg, because if you only have two legs, it's not going to cut it. And that third leg is the connection between the church and the home. Specifically, you know, what happens in the home really does shape our kids' ideas about what's real and normal. What real life is about for our kids is really what happens in the home. Paying the bills, getting up and getting dressed, cleaning, all this stuff, this is real life. And our kids will learn what's real and true based on what happens in the home. Yet, we have the church, which reveals to us what's real and true. God's presence, God's power, the communion of the saints, our, our identity as a body of Christ called to live liturgically and in worship. This eternal kingdom. So we have this reality of the church and this real life of the home. Which is true? Well, as Orthodox we would say the reality is God's revelation. But for our kids, what's real is what happens in the home. So that third leg of the stool is that the daily life of the home has to be intimately connected to that reality of Christ and his kingdom, the church. <clears throat> Number one, we have to connect our homes to the churches, which means physically, our families, the more we're involved in the sacramental, spiritual, and daily life of the parish, the more connected our homes will be to the church. 
There's really only one way to raise up children who understand themselves liturgically, as liturgical beings, and that's by getting them into church frequently, such that as families, we adjust our home life around the life of the church, getting them to church. So we get our kids to church as often as possible. And people say things like, you have such nice kids, they're in church. I'm like, you know, they're forced to be in church. <laughs> and you know what? You have nice kids too, in fact. We all have nice, good kids. But our goal as parenting is not to have nice, good kids. Our goal specifically is to raise up kids whose identities is liturgical. And there's only one way to do that. And they think it's normal. They think it's normal to go to a feast on Monday if it's the Feast of the Holy Cross. Don't tell them anything different. <clears throat> Why do they think it's normal? Because this is just what we do as a family. We have no other argument. This is just what we do. Um, it doesn't make them good. It's just internalizing this reality. Liturgical beings connecting the home to the church. Connecting the church to the home. Bringing the external practices of the church into the home. Is it real and normal to pray? Learning how to pray as a family. Learning how to pray before dinner. You know, I gave a talk about prayer as a family, and someone said, oh, you, you pray with your family? You should become a priest. I said, I pray as a family, I think, because we're orthodox, not because I'm a priest. But there's a sense that this, this is what religious people do. We don't do it because it, we're religious. I don't even know what that means. We do it because it's reality. This is the reality of prayer and God's presence in our home. So all the external practices. But there's something more. Each of these legs is actually about the inner life. So it's not enough to have your home look like an Orthodox home. Really, the purpose of these external practices is this inner transformation. So our kids need to see the inner life of the church lived out in the home that we need to bring those values and virtues of the kingdom of God into the home. That we actually are how to, learning to ask forgiveness. The expectation is patience, kindness, gentleness, and love. That we frame the struggles of our daily life in terms of this journey of acquiring the Holy Spirit. Because we believe that. That in the home is where we're working out our salvation. And so as we talk about kindness, patience, and forgiveness, we're paying attention to this inner life as real. And then when they go to the church, they hear these things. They hear the lives of the saints. They hear the Gospels. And they see this intimate connection between the real life of the home and the real life uh, that God reveals to us. So we internalize this reality of God's kingdom as we live in the home according to the values and virtues of the kingdom of God. And if your family is anything like mine, you will fail hopelessly because it's hard to be patient, it's hard to be kind. But we have an answer to that, too. We're not called to be perfect families. We're called to be repentant families. And what do we do when we've hurt each other, when we've reacted, when we get in these you know, these major catastrophic family fights that happen sometimes. It's like where the whole house, this thing's gonna collapse because it just activates and one person fights with one and then some person joins in and suddenly, you know, a little sleep deprivation and a late meal and suddenly the whole house is collapsing. That's just the struggles. Is that the end of the story? Well, it can't be the end of the story because there's been, there's been sin, there's been hurt. And someone will say, this whole day is ruined, you know, or. You ruined Christmas, you know, because it always happens around major holidays. <laughs> you ruined Thanksgiving. Well, they're half right, because sin destroys. But what they're not right about is repentance and forgiveness heals. And so we take the struggles that happen in daily life and return them to the life of the church through confession. And our kids get the sense that, oh, what happens in the home is really connected. So I haven't talked about God very much at all to my kids. We're just living this reality. And why are we living this reality? Because God has revealed to us as reality. Are we religious? Don't know what that means. What's my role as toward my kids? 
I live in this reality, and I love them the way we are called to love, and I fail the way I fail, and I repent the way I repent. Why do we do what we do? Because this is what's been revealed to us. What's the end result? Well, two things. I have no idea what the end result is because my kids will leave my home and they have a choice. The only thing we can do is raise them toward the kingdom, aimed at the kingdom, with these three-legged stool of our life, our relationship with them, and our connection to the life of the church. They have their choices. But no matter what they choose, how am I going to respond? The same way, out of this reality of uh, the kingdom of God. So there's a few just closing comments I want to say. Number one, it's still really freaky and it's still really scary. But that's my struggle. I need to do something with that fear, right? It might be talking to someone to figure out their different parenting strategies. It might be confessing the fear. For me, I have a rule, don't speak when I'm in that panic mode, because inevitably, I'll, parent, I'll talk to them out of fear. They will learn to say a prayer, learn to count to 10 when they say something, do freaking them out, and we learn to confess that fear. I already mentioned that notice, so I believe this three-legged stool is their religious education, and that the parents have the inside track in communicating reality. Um, but I do want to say, that when we think about this home, there's a lot of people who have contact with us in our day. Like our neighbors. Our kids play in the neighborhood. We have neighbors on both sides. We've got on one side, we have a, a, a couple with a few children who have told us that they're practicing pagan and their kids are our kids' ages and we play with them. On the other side, we have a home where the parents are divorced uh, the dad's from another country, the mom's there, and they play with us. And they're part of our community. And our door is open, and they come in our house, and our hearts are open. We are actually part of this community. We're just reaching out. And so, what happens on Sunday mornings is they say, can you play? And our answer is, nope, but we'll be back by one. We can't wait to play. Because we're just, why are we doing that? Just because we're living our life. And what happens? Well, this last Feast of the Holy Cross, we asked one of our neighbors. He had, he had the day off in Brookline for Rosh Hashanah, I believe. We said, we're going to liturgy for the Feast of the Holy Cross. Want to come? And he said, sure. Let me ask my mom. So he asked his mom. It wasn't the first time he'd come with us, right? So he comes to the liturgy. Now remember, this is the seminary, and this is the Feast of the Holy Cross. <laughs> right? So he comes there, and he sits in the front row with my boys. And I just want to mention one very interesting point. He's black. He's this adorable, his dad's from Jamaica, sweetest guy. We had asked him to come to church with us, and he'd come before. He went home, and he Googled, what is the Orthodox Church? <laughs> Seven-year-old comes back and says, you guys don't believe in the Pope. And he named one other thing that was one of the differences between the Orthodox and Catholic Church. So this time he comes with us, and he sits in the front row with my three boys. And I was told by the archdeacon that when the bishop came out and did his blessing, all four boys, my three boys and this cute little guy, just all went right and kind of matched it. <laughs> Are we shoving religion in his face? What are we doing to our neighbors? Do we have an agenda with this little boy? There is no agenda. We are just being who we are. We're not apologetic. We're just going, and it's an open invitation. So later that day, they went to the park. And on the way to the park, this boy tells my son, I can hear your church in the coming down from the sky now, in the heavens. coming down from the heavens. Later that day, he tells my son, I can hear your church coming down from the heavens now. Wow. We, you know, we believe the Holy Spirit is everywhere and working. Our vocation, we're not called to, well, how do I say this? Our primary call is not mission. That's the great commission. Our primary call is the great commandment. 
And the Great Commission is just a natural outgrowth of the Great Command, of the Great Commandment. We are called simply to be who we are and to love those around us. There really is no agenda. And frankly, that takes all of our time. But the fruit that we notice, if we take this reality seriously and live out of this reality, is our goal is not to get our kids to believe something or get our neighbor to believe something. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We just foster this work of grace by living in this reality and loving in this reality. We need open hearts and open homes. But there's something else we need. What church am I going to bring these American normal people to? Am I going to bring them to a parish that has open hearts and open doors? That live in this reality of God's kingdom and love that was sent to America for the whole world? Because there is no one on our street except the pagans who have any sort of community, religion, faith. It is a desert. And what we notice is there are a lot of people in our home. And there's one other thing about an open home and an open heart. If you have a lot of kids, what does your home look like? <laughs> now, my wife is here, so I'm going to tell you our home looks beautiful. <laughs> there is no clutter. Everything is always clean, right? And because it's being recorded. <laughs> The reality is not exactly that. Off record. Off record, right. If you can change, if you can take it off record, the reality is in order to have open hearts and open homes, you have to not care about what your, heart, what your home looks like. And what I think is so beautiful, the less we care about what the home looks like, the more these people are drawn in just because of the home. And they learn that it doesn't matter, just that we're living in this community. So while we don't have any guarantees, I just want to clarify that the vocation of the parent is to focus on the, this three-legged stool. Now, if the archbishop were here, he would correct what I said. So I'm going to correct myself before I finish. And the reality is, it's actually not a three-legged stool. The image is really nice, and I want to hold on to that. The reality is, Christ and his church are the foundation. Our lives as parents are the brick on top of that foundation, and our children are the brick above us. That our vocation as parents is simply to offer ourselves and our whole lives to Christ and love our kids such that the Holy Spirit works and continues on this foundation which was started with the apostles. Thank you very much.